From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We are in our Palo Alto studios today. We're still getting through COVID. Uh, thankfully, media was a, a necessary uh, industry, so we've been able to come in and keep a, a small COVID crew, but we can still reach out to the community and through the magic of the internet and cameras on laptops, we can reach out and, and touch base with our friends. So we're excited to have somebody who's talking about and working on kind of the next big edge, the next big cutting thing going on in technology, and that's the Internet of Things. You've heard about it, the industrial Internet of Things. There's a lot of different words for it. But at the foundation of it is this company, it's Intel. We're happy to have join us Bill Pearson. He is the Vice President of Internet of Things, often said IoT, uh, for Intel. Bill, great to see you. Same, Jeff, nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So you, I just was teasing, getting ready for this uh, interview, doing a little homework, and I saw you talking about Internet of Things in a 2015 interview, actually referencing a 2014 interview. Uh, so you've been <laughs> at this for a while. So before we jump into where we are today, I wonder if you can share, you know, kind of a little bit of a perspective of what's happened over the last five or six years. I mean, I think data has really grown at a tremendous pace, uh, which has changed the perception of what IoT is going to do for us. And uh, the other thing that's been uh, really interesting is the rise of AI. And of course, we need it to be able to make sense of all that data. So, you know, one thing that's different is today we're, we're really focused on how do we take that data that is uh, being produced at this rapid rate and really make sense of it uh, so that people can get better business outcomes from that. Right, right. But then there's, but the thing that's so interesting on the, the things part of the Internet of Things, and even though people are things too, is that the scale and the pace of, of data that's coming off kind of machine generated activity versus people generated is orders of magnitude higher in terms of the frequency, the variety, and all kind of your, your classic big data memes. So that's a very different challenge than, you know, kind of the growth of, of data that we had before and the types of data, because it's really gone kind of exponential across every single vector. Absolutely, it, it has. I mean, we've seen estimates that data is going to increase by about five times uh, as much as it is today over the next just couple of years. So it's, it's exponential, as you said. Right. The other thing that's happened is cloud. Um, and so, you know, kind of breaking, kind of breaking the mold of the old mold where all the compute was either in your mini computer or data center or mainframe or on your laptop. Now, you know, with cloud and, and instant connectivity, you know, it opens up a lot of different opportunities. So now we're coming to the edge uh, and internet of things. So when you look at kind of edge and internet of things kind of now folding into this ecosystem, you know, what are some of the tremendous benefits that we can get by leveraging those things that we couldn't with kind of the old infrastructure and our old way of kind of gathering and storing and acting on data? Yeah, so one of the things we're doing today with the edge is really bringing the compute much closer to where all the data is being generated. So these sensors and devices are, are generating tons and tons of data. And for a variety of reasons, we can't send it somewhere else to get processed. You know, there may be latency requirements for that control loop that you're running in your factory, or there's bandwidth constraints that you have, or there's just security or privacy reasons to keep it on site. And so you've got to process a lot of this, this data uh, on site. And some estimates are maybe half of the, the data is going to remain on site here. And when you look at that, you know, that's where you need compute. And so the edge is all about taking compute, bringing it to where the data is, and then being able to use the intelligence, the AI and analytics to make sense of that data and take actions in real time. Right, right. But it's a complicated situation, right? Because depending on where that edge is, what the what the device is, does it have power? Does it not have power? Does it have you know, good connectivity? Does it not have good connectivity? Does it does it uh, have the, even the ability to, to run those types of, of, of algorithms or does it have to send it to some uh, interim step even if it doesn't have you know, kind of the ability to send it all the way back to the cloud or all the way back to the data center for latency? So as you kind of slice and dice all these pieces of the chain, um, where do you see the great opportunity for Intel? Where, where's a good kind of sweet spot where you can start to bring in some compute horsepower and you can start to bring in some algorithmic uh, processing and actually do things uh, between just the itty bitty sensor at the in, itty bitty end of the chain versus the data center that's way, way upstream and far, far away. 
Yeah, our business is really high performance compute. And it's this idea of taking all of these workloads and bringing them into this high performance compute to be able to run multiple software defined workloads uh, on single boxes to be able to then process and analyze and store all that data that's that's being created at the edge, uh, do it in a, in a high performance way. And whether that's a, a retail a smart shelf, for example, that we can do real-time inventory on that shelf as things are coming and going, uh, or whether it's a factory and somebody doing you know, real-time defect detection of something moving across their textile line. So all of that comes down to being able to have the compute horsepower to make sense of the data uh, and do something with it. Right, right. So you wouldn't necessarily, like in your, in your shelf example, that you know, that, that the compute might be done there at the local store or some, some aggregation point beyond just that actual, you know, kind of sensor that's underneath that one box of, uh, of Tide, if you will. Absolutely. Yeah, you could have that on-prem, uh, a big box that does multiple uh, shelves, for example. Yeah. Okay, great. So there's a great example, and, and you guys have the software development kit, you have a lot of resources for developers. And, and one of the case studies that I just wanted to highlight before we jump into the dev side was I think Audi was the customer. And it, it really illustrates a point that we talked about a lot in, in kind of the big data meme, which is you know, people used to take action on a sample of data after the fact. Uh, and I think this case they were talking about running a thousand cars a day through this factory, they're doing so many welds, five million welds a day, and they would pull one at the end of the day, sample a couple welds, and uh, did we have a good day or not? Versus what they're doing now with your technology is actually testing each and every weld as it's being welded based on data that's coming off the welding machine, and they're inspecting every single weld. So I just love, you've been at this for a long time, when you talk to customers about what is possible from a business point of view, when you go from after the fact with a sample of data to in real time with all the data, how that completely changes your view and ability to react to your business. Yeah, I mean, it makes uh, people be able to make better decisions in real time, you know, as you've got uh, cameras on things like uh, textile manufacturers or uh, footwear manufacturers, uh, or even these real-time inventory examples you mentioned, people are going to be able to make and can make decisions in real time about how to stock that shelf, what to order, about what to pull off the line, am I getting a, a good product or, or not? Um, and this has really changed. As you said, we don't have to go back and sample anymore. You can tell right now as that part is passing through your manufacturing line or as that item is sitting on your shelf, what's happening to it. It's really incredible. So let's talk about developers. So you've got a lot of resources available for developers and, and everyone knows Intel, um, obviously historically in, in PCs and data centers and, and you, would, you would do what, what they call design wins. Um, back when I was there many moons ago, right? You try to get a design win and then you know they're going to put your, your microprocessors and, and a bunch of other components in a device. When you're trying to work with um, kind of cutting edge developers in kind of new fields and new areas, this feels like a much more direct touch to the actual people building the applications than the people that are really just designing the systems of which Intel becomes a core part of. I wonder if you could talk about um, you know, the role of developers and really Intel's outreach to developers and how you're trying to help them you know, kind of move forward in this new, uh, this new crazy world. Yeah, developers are essential to our business. They're essential to IoT. Um, developers, as you said, create the applications that are going to really make the business possible. And so we know the value of developers and want to make sure that they have the tools and resources that they need to use our products most effectively. Um, We've done some things around OpenVINO Toolkit as an example to really try and simplify, democratize uh, AI applications so that more developers can take advantage uh, of this and you know take the ambitions that they have to do something really interesting for their business and then go put it into to action. Um, and the whole, you know, our whole purpose is making sure we can actually accomplish that. Right. So let's talk about OpenVINO. It's, a, it's an interesting topic. So I actually found out what OpenVINO means. Open Visual Inference and Neural Optimization Toolkit. So it's, it's a lot about computer vision. Um, so I will, you know, and, and computer vision is an interesting early AI application that I think a lot of people are familiar with through Google Photos or other things where, you know, suddenly they're putting together little little uh, highlight movies for you or they're they're pulling together all the, the, the photos of a particular person or a particular place. 
Um, so the computer vision is pretty interesting. Inference is a special is a special subset of AI. So I wonder, you know, you guys are way behind OpenVINO. Where do you see the opportunities in visualization? What are some of the, the instances that you're seeing with the developers out there doing innovative things around computer vision? Yeah, there's a whole variety of, of use cases with computer vision. You know, one that we talked about earlier here was looking at uh, defect detection. There's a, a company that we work with that has a 360 degree view. They use cameras all around their uh, manufacturing line. And from there, they know what a good part looks like. And using inference and OpenVINO, they can tell when a bad part goes through or there's a, a defect in their line. And they can go and pull that and, and make corrections as needed. We've also seen you know, use cases like um, smart shopping where there's a point of sale fraud detection, we call it. You know, is the item being scanned the same as the, the item that you know, is actually going through the, the line? Um, and so we can be much smarter about understanding re retail. Uh, one example that I, I saw was a customer who was uh, trying to detect if it was uh, vodka or potatoes that was being you know, scanned in an automated checkout system. And again, using cameras and open vino, they can tell the difference. <laughs> We haven't talked about uh, computer tasting yet. We're still sticking with computer vision and the natural language <laughs> processing. Um, I know one of the areas you're interested in and, and it's going to only increase in importance um, is, is education. Um, especially with what's going on, I keep waiting for someone to start rolling out some, some national you know, best practice education courses for kindergartens and third graders and sixth graders and you know, all these poor teachers that are learning to teach on the fly from home. Um, you guys are doing a lot of work in education. I wonder if you can share, I think you're work, doing some work with uh, Audacity. Or Audacity, what are, what are you doing? Where do you see the opportunity to apply some of this AI and, and, and IoT in education? Yeah, we launched a nano degree with Udacity and uh, it's all about uh, OpenVINO and Edge AI. And the, the idea is again, get more developers educated on this technology, uh, take a leader like Udacity, partner with them to make the coursework available and, and get you know, more developers understanding, using and building things uh, using Edge AI. And so we partnered with them to, as part of their million developer goal. Um, we're trying to get as many developers as, as possible through that. Okay. And I would be remiss if we talked about IoT and I didn't throw 5G uh, into the conversation. So, it's, you know, 5G is a is a really big deal. I know Intel's put a ton of resources behind it and have been talking about it for a long, long time. You know, I think the huge value in in 5G is a lot around IoT as opposed to my uh, handset going faster. Which is funny that they're actually releasing 5G handsets out there. But when you look at 5G combined with the other capabilities in IoT, again. How do you see 5G being this kind of step function in ability to do real-time analysis and make real-time business decisions? Well, I think it you know brings more uh, connectivity certainly and uh, bandwidth and reduces latency. But the, the the cool thing about it is when you look at the applications of it, you know we talked about factories. A lot of those factories may want to have uh, private 5G networks that are running inside that that factory, running all the machines or robots or things in there. And uh, so you know it brings capabilities that actually make a difference in the the world of IoT and the the things that developers are trying to build. That's great. So before I let you go, you've been at this for a while. Um, you've been at Intel for a while. You've seen a lot of big uh, sweeping changes kind of come through the industry. You know, as you sit back with a little bit of perspective, you know, and it's funny, even IoT, like we said, you've been talking about it for, for five years and 5G we've been, been waiting for, but, but the waves keep coming, right? That's kind of the fun of being in this business. As you sit there where you are today, you know, kind of looking forward the next couple of years, couple, four or five years, you know, what, is, what has just surprised you beyond compare and, and what are you um, still kind of surprised it's still a little bit lagging that you would have expected to see a little bit more progress uh, at this point? You know, to me, the incredible thing about uh, the computing industry is just the insatiable demand that the world has for compute. It seems like we uh, always come up with, our customers always come up with more and more uses for this compute power. Um, you know, as we've talked about data and the exponential growth of data, now we need to process and analyze and store that, that data. It's impressive to see developers just constantly thinking about new ways to apply their craft uh, and you know, new ways to use all that available computing power. And uh, you know, I, I'm delighted because I've, I've been at this for a while, as you said, and I just see this continuing to go for as far as the eye can see. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It's, there's, there's no shortage of opportunity. I mean, 
the, the data explosion is kind of funny. The data's always been there. We just weren't keeping track of it before. Um, and, and, you know, and the other thing I, that as I look at, at your uh, Internet of Things kind of toolkit, you guys have such a broad portfolio now where a lot of times people think of Intel pretty much as a CPU company. But as you mentioned, you've got FPGAs and, and VPUs and uh, vision solutions for edge applications. So Intel has really done a good job in terms of broadening the portfolio to go after, you know, kind of this disparate or, or um, kind of sharding, if you will, of all these different types of computer applications have very different uh, demands in terms of power and bandwidth and 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 crunching uh, utilization to technical. Yeah, absolutely. The, the 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 various computer architectures really just they help our customers with the the needs, whether it's you know high power, low performance, a mixture of both. Um, being able to use all of those uh, heterogeneous architectures with a tool like OpenVINO, Vino, so you can program once, write once, and then run your application across any of those architectures, helps simplify the you know life of our developers, but also gives them the compute performance uh, the way that they need it. All right, Bill. We'll keep at it. Uh, thank you for all your hard work and uh, hopefully it won't be five years before we're checking in to see how far this, uh, this IOT thing is going. Hopefully not. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> all right, Bill, thanks a lot. He's Bill, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.